Welcome back at the CPS Connect 2020, live from Stuttgart. Um, the topic now is uh, Industrial Artificial Intelligence, Future of Automation. Now I'm able to introduce you two speakers for the following lecture. For one thing, it will be Dr. Matthias Loskiel. He's Director Art, uh, Advanced Artificial Intelligence at Siemens AG Factory Automation. And I will also introduce you to Henning Oxenfeld, Head of Data Science and ML Engineering Department at Siemens customer service. This lecture is about artificial intelligence assists in every area, area of our lives. Whether we are trying to read our emails, get driving directions, get music or move recommendations. Bottom line, it makes our life much easier. But how does AI work in a dynamic industrial environment and what benefits does it offer and how to implement AI? A lot of questions, but here comes the answer with Matthias uh, Loiskiel and Henning Oxenfeld. Welcome. Yes, thanks a lot for having us here in this virtual environment. We're going to talk about two of our favorite topics today, industrial AI and the future of automation. My name is Matthias Loskel, and I'm here with my colleague Henning Oxenfeld. Hi. So Henning, before we start our discussion, let's have a look at a short movie. Let's have a look into the future, the future of automation. Instead of rigid production lines that produce the same product every day, we see autonomous factories in the future. These will be highly modular, highly flexible. They will be connected via autonomous mobile robots that have AI-based intelligence inside. These autonomous systems will be able to perceive the environment, to reason about different sensor signals, to make intelligent decisions. For example, objects can be detected on the fly, as you can see it now. Also, very flexible handling will be possible. These robots, robots will be able to grasp even objects that they have never seen before or objects that are moving on a conveyor belt. With this intelligence powered by AI, these autonomous mobile robots will be even able to collaborate to form fleets of intelligent assets and to drive further optimization of our production systems. This may sound like science fiction, but this is much closer to reality than you might think. So Henning, we saw some examples of how AI is used in, in our vision, but also today already in industrial production, like object detection, flexible grasping of objects, autonomous machines, autonomous systems in general. What other applications of AI do you see in industry? Thanks, Matthias. Also welcome from my side. Um, yes, indeed, uh, there's <clears throat> already many in place. Uh, I think if you, for example, think about predictive maintenance applications or animal detection for uh, a couple of, uh, let's say, industrial um, areas, even though not many of them are already, uh, let's say, in place in an industrial grade fashion, mm -hmm. but there's, um, it's, it's quite good understood and uh, a lot of activities have been going on. Um, I see currently great potential when it comes to, let's say, visual quality inspection or quality assurance um, in pr long production lines, since there's a lot of non-productive uh, efforts uh, spent to assure quality, to inspect objects uh, manually, to um, do end-of-line testing or uh, partly testing in between. And I think AI offers great potential to automate a lot or even better inspect or to higher accuracy detect um, malfunction products or uh, um, less quality uh, products than we have today. So great potential there, definitely. Right, totally agree. These are very popular fields that you just mentioned. So they spring up like mushrooms yeah. and in every vertical that we see out there, let it be automotive or electronics production or machine building. We will see actually a few examples later on that we have brought today. I see one very important application field um, in addition to that. And this is process optimization. Yeah. You know, there you can really leverage additional um, earnings in terms of throughput or productivity increase. And there are new technologies out there. Just think about reinforcement learning, one of the newest types in AI that you can use to let systems learn to optimize themselves or to tune parameters of a production yeah. process. So I think there is really a big potential still open to that we yeah. should leverage. Definitely, totally agree. Um, Matthias, I would say, let's see 
uh, since we're convinced that there is a lot of potential, uh, what does it take to bring industry and AI together? Um, I'm certain, and uh, I think you, you have the experience uh, likewise in your uh, application fields, that if you bring both domains, AI, which is a rather research and academic uh, thing today, uh, and industrial, very you know, heavy industries and shop floors and IT, OT landscapes together, um, there is a culture class, so to speak. Absolutely. And if we then assume that, for example, by AI applications, as we will see later, um, replace, for example, um, hardware testing, mm -hmm. just as an example, um, you can guess how important it is to ensure the functioning and the reliability and the robustness and the trustworthiness and security and all of that aspects along this, let's say, software workflow. So, um, and if you think of the din dynamics on the shop floor, so the, the data uh, points that vary due to, I don't know, varying products or data channels that uh, completely vanish or new um, coming on top or, uh, you know, make up your examples yourself. You know the, the shop floor very, very well. Um, I think this dynamic also uh, relates to the, to the data space where our AI algorithms work in. Um, and these require really, uh, let's say, also industrial AI services around it. Um, to ensure robust and reliable operation. So the dynamics meet the mission criticality of the production line. Um, and this is certainly a thing uh, we as Siemens can cope with, with a, let's say, bundle of expertise we put together here. Absolutely. This is one of the biggest challenges, I would say. This is what I call where we need industrial grade AI. Exactly. Right? Robustness, reliability, trustworthiness, safety and security, exactly. all the points you mentioned, really crucial. I see more challenges, actually. One very typical challenge that we of, often face is um, the, the quality problem in your data. So data yeah. scarcity, imbalanced data sets, the labeling effort that you have, the domain expertise that you need to label the data, this is really difficult, much more difficult than in the consumer world most of the times. So how to tackle that? How to, for example, solve the imbalance data problem? You might have a lot of examples of good data, let's say, but very often you do not have enough samples of um, the bad data, the cases you actually want to predict, like the defect of a product, as mm -hmm. we mentioned, or the failure of a component, like a motor or a pump, for example. How to deal with that? So one point is what we often do is using synthetic data generation. So leveraging our digital enterprise software like design, simulation, engineering software to generate data for the training of your AR models. So mm -hmm. you can augment your real world training data with synthetic data, so to say. This is very powerful and this yeah. really helps you to improve accuracy, quick start your AI model training, so to say. Cool. Second point is using newest technologies. For example, we investigate few shot learning a lot. Just using a handful of samples to retrain your AI models. This is what it, this is all about. Mm -hmm. This also has quite a big potential, in my opinion. Yeah. Second big challenge: bringing AI closer to the shop floor. So make it applicable to not only those data scientists out there that are again, again a scarce resource, um, but also make it applicable to automation engineers, for example, to all the PLC programmers out there. And what we did is we just released the so-called TMNPU which is an AI module that you can directly plug to the PLC, for example, to the S7-1500 controller. So it can directly communicate with your controller on the field level, and it, mm -hmm. can, um, it has an AI acceleration chip inside. So you can deploy your AI model directly on that chip. It can make the inferencing <coughs> on the field level. It can be engineered by an automation engineer, very convenient for them, for example, using the TL portal. Yeah. So that's, that's really crucial, in my opinion, democratizing AI, if you like, also for yeah. the engineering world. True. Yeah, I think we can, we can sum up industrial AI requires a lot more expertise than just AI and domain know-how, and especially making it industrially great yeah. in operation is a, is, a, is a big issue. Let's go to some examples. We brought some use cases. Uh, I would like to show you uh, at least one um, very quickly where we went to do uh, beer brewing and uh, quality assurance uh, in beer brewing. So here we utilize AI to um, uh, model basically the relationships between a lot of, uh, so we're talking about hundreds uh, of parameters that affect the beer brewing process um, and the final quality. Um, and then later on utilize these models to 
um, try to explain which parameters or combinations of parameters uh, drove the quality most or influenced the quality most, and then derive countermeasures how to improve or guarantee a stable uh, beer quality. This is something I personally really like due to the domain we are working with. That's really a cool use case. Yeah, actually, I know a similar one from a totally different domain. Um, I know that one from battery production. You know, batteries like that are used for electrical vehicles nowadays. Mm -hmm quite hot topic nowadays, um, it's about the battery formation process. So this is the, the bottleneck of every battery production. You need to um, load and unload the battery initially to activate the material, the chemicals inside. So that's a quite a critical process. You need mm -hmm. a lot of domain knowledge. It takes many hours. So it's really important that you understand the correlations between your parameters, how they affect the quality, similar as what you just said for the beer brewing. And it's about optimizing this. Yeah. So with intelligent algorithms, we can make suggestions to the operator how to tune the parameters or even optimize this process automatically. Yeah. And I would like to dig into a little bit more detail uh, into one use case from our electronics plants. Mm -hmm. um, here we see in a second, I think, a video um, where we are in our electronic um, production where we produce the printed circuit boards. You can see them here. And you, you have to think there is a fully automated production line right now. But at the end, you see it, there is loading of the so-called ICT tests or the in-circuit test where some needles uh, um, check whether the board is uh, functioning or not. And this testing itself has a lot of pseudo errors. So once in a while, these needles get contaminated uh, and produce pseudo errors. And this requires manual rework and, and a lot of manual efforts. And by means of AI and based on the parameters uh, we get out of this uh, testing, we predict the likelihood of being it a, a pseudo error or a real error of the test. And um, with a, let's say, a high accuracy, we re achieve uh, up to 50% uh, test effort oh. uh, reductions nowadays, which amount up to 5% uh, increase in first pass yield, which is mm -hmm. uh, a case we are really proud of within uh, Siemens and our own plans. And um, as I said, we are reducing the testing efforts uh, quite a lot, amounting to a six digit saving per, per year. So very quick uh, return mm -hmm. on invest also mm -hmm. for such a case and industrially uh, uh, implemented and operated. It's very important. Point. Well, that's impressive. And these are impressive numbers showing the efficiency increase, right? Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. I have one last use case I would like to explain a bit more detail. And we are in the automotive industry here. As you can see on the picture, uh, we are in the body shop. So this is where the car parts are welded together by these big robots uh, with, with some welding um, tools. And um, the problem here is that often splashes occur during the welding process. So weld splashes on the car body. And this can be quite sharp. Right. So this can be, first of all, a safety issue for the workers later on assembling the car. And second, it can also damage the material, like the cables that you want to mount later on in, in the process. So you need to get rid of these, and you need to understand where are critical splashes and where is it OK. And what we did here is with one of our customers, we had a project where we um, gave a quality score to every weld spot. So we were able to predict whether this uh, weld spot is OK or if there is a critical splash mm -hmm. and if some rework is then needed. And this was realized with the team and BU that I just mentioned. So here, the automation engineer has really the AI solution in his or her hands. They can really um, retrain the model even on site. They can deploy the deep learning model directly close to the PLC and interaction with the PLC happens directly on the field level. So this is really giving AI in the hand of our engineers. And it's, it's a real world use case use uh, solved with deep learning technology. Cool. Sounds, sounds awesome. Yeah, I think uh, in general, we are, um, we, we are well equipped uh, nowadays, but uh, we also know there are a lot of challenges coming, um, especially when it comes uh, to, you know, bringing all that numbers that are associated with industrial AI applications and uh, the market. And um, I think we are at the beginning and facing a lot of action fields we should uh, work on currently with our customers to enable them and technology uh, likewise to tackle these challenges. Absolutely. Yeah. There's still so many opportunities open that we can tackle with AI. And I believe we need to work in ecosystem. So we are now partnering with many uh, system yeah. integrators, with startups, 
with our customers, bringing AI know-how together with domain knowledge and really building up these ecosystems. That's crucial, in my opinion, to build up industrial grade AI to really make it happen yeah. and go the step from proof of concept to real world applications. Yeah. Right. So this is the journey we are going to take together. Okay. And we have our plans, our own plans at hand to experiment with and, and right. learn it by pain, how it works. Right. So I would say let's, let's close at this point our discussion. We could go on, on and on for hours. Um, let's give our audience uh, the chance to ask them questions. Thanks a lot at this point. Yeah, thank you very much for your great lecture. And of course, I have some questions for you. And I would like to invite you to our Q&A session. Uh, my first question is, um, how do you deal with situations where you only have small um, data sets available, maybe just a few pictures? Can you still use AI also in this case? Should I take that one? Yeah, so I, I briefly talked about that, actually. So. Um, I think there are different different ways you can uh, solve this problem. So first of all, we support our customers with so-called connectivity services. So we help to help them to connect uh, collect the right data with connectivity. Um, but if it's still a problem because maybe you do not have enough cases of failures of your components because this might happen only every few years, then these uh, technologies around can use uh, future learning technologies, for example, <coughs> to train your models with only small data. You can try to augment your training data with synthetically generated data from design and simulation tools. And also we are uh, motivating our, our ecosystem partners um, in the context of the MindSphere World organization with so-called shared data pools. This means we try to bring the data sets together. We try to develop common AI models that everyone can use within the ecosystem. I think that's another crucial measure to overcome this, this problem with uh, scarce <coughs> data in, in industry. Thank you very much. Um, you talk uh, about challenges with industry and uh, AI. How do you know about uh, these challenges? Maybe I can take it. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe as I said in my final, um, <clears throat> final statement, um, actually, we are not only working with external customers, we are also working with our internal customers, which are basically our own plans, uh, for example, in electronics. And um, bringing, as Matthias said, AI to the shop floor there, which means um, not only develop nice machine learning models and uh, pre-processing and uh, data pipelines, but, only, uh, but also be able to integrate it on industrial edge devices, deploy it there, uh, monitor it, um, and operate it uh, to a certain degree to ensure this, uh, as I talked about, reliability and then robustness. Um, this is something we experience in our own use cases as well. So it's uh, exactly similar to the shop floors of our customers. Uh, we know about and uh, we have this experience in industrial AI exactly due to real world projects. It's nothing you can learn in uh, laboratories or in, in white papers. Uh, you, I can uh, highly recommend to experience that in, in uh, um, real uh, applications where you try to um, unlock the value of AI, AI in your um, shop floor. And uh, one question I have here um, from Slido. Um, Dimitros Petris wants to know how can you make sure that the PLC programs created by the AI are conform with the uh, EAC 61131 and how is the topic of uh, functional safety considered in that matter? Thank you for your answers. I think these are two questions. Uh, maybe let's, let's try the first one. So we, we didn't talk about uh, PLC code generation, actually. I think this is, a, is another topic. Uh, certainly, you would, wouldn't go with a pure AI-based approach. Probably, you would need some, some rule-based approach in combination. What we said is you have your PLC program, which is, which is um, programmed according to the standards. But on the other hand side, this communicates with an AI model, so a deep learning model, for example. So it gives some input data to the AI model, and the PLC program receives some feedback from the AI model, so to say. This is how it usually works, and this is how we, we set it up in most cases. Uh, when it comes to safety, um, we certainly see some challenges still for AI, because it's all about probability, right? So we must really make sure, in particular for safety critical applications, that you have some fallback strategy. Maybe you have something like, like um, a sandbox or um, you embedded your AI model into some 
software that still um, needs to know knows how to react in, in critical cases where the AI model maybe does not perform so well. And also you must have some kind of explainability and trustworthiness. So you need to know uh, when your AI model is, is has a high confidence, so to say, and when it has not, uh, it's not so sure that the prediction is correct. So these are really important measures um, we are actually working on. Okay, so thank you very much that you take time for this uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matthias Loskül and Henning Oxenfeld. Um, wish you the best and maybe we can see you next year live at the um, SPS in Nürnberg. Thank you very much. So, hier geht es weiter und zwar um 12.20 Uhr mit den Roundtables. Da können Sie sich jetzt schon mal für anmelden. 50 Personen sind immer zugelassen. Sie können die Auswahl finden, indem Sie in der Eventagenda nach Roundtables filtern. Und dann heißt es in diesem Falle, wer zuerst da ist, der kann sich einen Platz sichern. Um 13.35 Uhr darf ich Sie dann hier zum nächsten Thema begrüßen. Dann heißt es der digitale Zwilling für Sensoren als maschinenlesbare Datenquelle. Erarbeitung von auf Standards basierenden Sensorik-Teilmodellen für die Verwaltungsschale im ZVI-Arbeitskreis Industrie 4.0 in der Sensorik. Wir sehen uns dann wieder um 13.35 Uhr. Bis dahin wünsche ich Ihnen viel Freude bei den Roundtables und nachher hier wieder live auf der Technology Stage.